This is the Western Front, 1914 to 1918, during the Great War. On these battlefields in France and Belgium, over five million men died, and many are buried where they fell, in thousands of war cemeteries. Millions of families lost loved ones during the Great War. It brought about a level of suffering that was unheard of. A hundred years later, those war cemeteries are our link to their loss. The real story of the Great War is in the cemeteries. This is Dominion Cemetery, and it's one of 700 war cemeteries along the old Western Front that contains Canadian burials. The cemeteries are unique in the way they freeze history, like from no other period. And each grave tells a story. This is the grave of Lieutenant Alec Campbell Johnson of Vancouver, 16th Battalion Canadian Infantry, which was the Canadian Scottish. And he was killed in action at the Drocourt Quiant line by machine gun fire when crossing these fields on September the 2nd, 1918. He was 16 when he enlisted, and he was 18 when he was killed. 60,000 Canadians were killed in the Great War, and that meant 60,000 grieving families, and some families suffered worse than others. Three rows over, we have another grave. This is the grave of Private Ronald Campbell Johnson, Alex's brother. He was with the 7th Battalion, British Columbia, and he was killed one day later, September the 3rd, 1918. He was 29 years old. These cemeteries are truly unique, and now they hold the memory and sacrifice of a long ago generation. They are truly our sacred places. Rudyard Kipling wrote a verse commemorating these cemeteries, and it goes, from little towns in a far land we came to save our honor in a world of flame. By little towns in a far land we sleep and trust the world we won for you to keep. I'm military historian Norm Christie. I've been touring the old Western Front for 30 years by visiting the famous and not so famous cemeteries and battlefields you'll get a unique perspective on the war and the men and women who fought it on the Great War Tour. Thirty years ago, I was traveling through Europe and I drove up this road and I discovered a remarkable little war cemetery. But what I had really found was a time capsule from the Great War. This is Beaucourt British Cemetery in France, and it contains the graves of 90 men killed at Beaucourt in August 1918. It's one of 16,000 Commonwealth war grave sites in more than 100 countries that commemorate 1.1 million Commonwealth war dead of the Great War. And each site is unique. The reason that each site is so special is based on the principles of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. The first principle is that no bodies were to be repatriated, so all the men are buried near to where they fell. Secondly, there's universality of treatment, so everyone gets the same headstone regardless of rank or status in life. The third is that every name will be remembered, either on a headstone or on a memorial to the missing. But it's the headstones that tell you the story of the real war. This is the grave of Donald Eric Turner, 54th Battalion, British Columbia, Canadian Infantry. Killed in action August 8, 1918, and he was only 19 years old. His family added this inscription to his headstone. He that loses his life shall find it. Shortly after the battle, his mother received a letter from his platoon officer describing how Eric was killed. Dear Mrs. Turner, it is with great regret that I have to inform you that your boy, Private D. Turner, 
was killed in action in our great and glorious advance of August 8th. Your boy used to talk a lot about you, and I know how fond he was of you. He was a good boy and an excellent soldier, bright, intelligent, and always cheery. Your boy died a true hero's death. He gave his young life gladly, I know, for our king, our country. And your boy was buried alongside several of his friends in Beaucourt Cemetery. We're on the road to Vimy Ridge. We're going to go to Cabaret Rouge, north of the city of Arras in northern France, which is one of the largest and most impressive cemeteries on the Western Front. The first time you see these cemeteries, it's just incredible how beautiful they are, how tranquil they are, how quiet. It's hard to understand the suffering and the brutality that they actually represent. The Great War was so different than anything else that anyone had ever seen. That's why it was the Great War. More men were killed, more men were maimed, more families had to grieve. And there really was an, an inadequate response for such, such losses, such carnage. There were many bloody battles during the Great War, but the Battle of the Somme was the bloodiest. During the Battle of the Somme, so many men were killed in such a small area. There were bodies everywhere. And the men would go up to the front, and there would there be their comrade lying there in a shell hole, decaying. And they realized that this was having a demoralizing effect, not surprisingly. So they decided to develop a method of handling the bodies. And they set up the Directorate of Grave Registration and Inquiries so they would register the graves, have men to properly bury them, and then register them and send them back to a headquarters where they would be kept in a ledger so they knew where the graves were. Also, they had, for hygiene reasons, they had to start taking them away from the front line. They wouldn't bury them in the trench like they had earlier in the war. They put them in battlefield cemeteries. They put them just behind the lines. So throughout the Western Front, hundreds and hundreds of little cemeteries started building up. Cabaret Rouge is a perfect example of a concentration cemetery. It has an original plot of a few hundred graves made in 1917 due to the fighting around Vimy Ridge. And then after the war, it was enlarged by 7,000 graves brought in from as north as Armand Chairs and as south as the Somme. These concentration cemeteries give you a wider history. It tells you grave by grave the development of the fighting and how the Great War progressed. Here's an identified grave. Sergeant V.N. Stearns, Canadian Machine Gun Corps, killed in action August 7, 1917. He was 28 years old. You have a Latin cross here, and at the bottom, a personal inscription supplied by his family. Sometime, we'll understand. Millions of men had marched away to war, and it must have been incomprehensible to those left behind that so many of their loved ones never came home. One of the founding principles of the Imperial War Graves Commission was that no bodies were to be repatriated. The men were to be buried amongst their comrades close to where they fell. And they did this for a number of reasons. One was cost for repatriation. And of course, if you repatriated some, what would you do with the others that didn't want them repatriated or the families that were dead or gone or the unknowns? So it was an, a very strong principle to do, to keep them buried with their comrades. But of course, this caused a lot of trouble for families that lived a long way away. In Canada, for example, it was a huge event to try to come to Europe to visit a grave, or for Australians or for New Zealanders, likewise. So many of these graves have never been visited by their families. After the war, there were many visitors from nearby Britain. There was even a cafe here for them. But it's long gone, and so are the visitors. 
Hardly anyone comes to visit the graves at Cabaret Rouge anymore. We're leaving France and heading north into Belgium and the city of Ypres. This is where we find the largest concentration of war cemeteries in the world. And during the war, it was known as the Ypres Salient. The Ypres Salient was formed in 1914, and it was held until 1918. And it was really a bulge in the German line. And the problem was any troops stationed here were vulnerable to heavy artillery fire coming from all three directions, because the Germans basically sur surrounded them on three quarters. I remember one veteran explaining, you knew you were in Yeep. You could smell the stench of death from all the dead bodies of the horses and the men that had been laying out there. It ends up being one of the largest burial grounds on Earth. There's more than 125 war grave cemeteries around here. One of the ones we're going to have a look at is White House Cemetery, which is on this route. This road is one of the transport routes that was used out of Yeep to the outer edges of the salient. White House Cemetery is the perfect example of a battlefield cemetery. They're little regimental cemeteries in some cases, three or four guys killed by the same shell. And of course, they would have been killed on the road going up to the front or coming back. They would have been wounded. They would have made an advanced dressing station here at White House, which is how the cemetery got its name. And if you were unlucky enough to get hit, this is where you'd end up. So this is how this cemetery came to be. These headstones are interesting because there are no bodies buried beneath them. These are graves that were registered, but later lost or destroyed in battle, and they are commemorated along the outside walls of the cemeteries. They don't, in fact, mark a burial. If there's a big enough group, they often mark them with what is called a do hallow block, which gives the history of what happened to the graves and how they got lost. During the war from about 1917 on, they had a directorate of grave registration and inquiries. So they'd say he was buried in White House, uh, plot one, row D, grave nine. So let's suppose in 1917 or 18, during the Passchendaele fighting, the shelling would come in. It would destroy the graves. So when the guys came in 1919 or 1920 to finish up the cemetery, there's no evidence of that grave. But they have a record that he's buried there. Therefore, they would use a special memorial. They're holding a memory of something that vanished. And for the families at home, they would get a registration saying the guy was buried in White House Cemetery, plot row, and grave. And of course, one of the great tragedies of, these, of the First World War is that the men just vanished. There was uh, hundreds and hundreds of widows and mothers who came back to France in 1919, 1920, 1921, looking for their lost son or their lost husband. It was a very, very tragic consequence of the war. But they had to try to find the body, and it was very significant to those people to do so. And for more than half of the men killed in the First World War, there is no grave. These two headstones illustrate the two basic headstone layouts. This is the broad cross. You can see the large cross with the cap badge in the middle. And this was chosen by certain British regiments based on aesthetics. The other layout is the Latin cross. You can see it here, and here's the cap badge. And this was one chosen by the Canadians. Details on the headstones will often give you a lot of information about the soldier. After the cemeteries were closed for burials, final verification forms were sent out to the next of kin. And then the family could determine a religious symbol, they could put on the age, they could put on the Christian names, or they could add a personal inscription to the bottom of the stone. And these personal inscriptions are particularly poignant. And this is Captain John Woods of Toronto, 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles, killed in action 24 October 1917, age 25. And the personal inscription reads, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And the initials at the bottom, E-D-W, his mother. Goodbye, good luck. God bless.
The cemeteries were designed as Edwardian gardens in perpetuity, proper treatment for the fallen heroes of the Great War. But it's been a hundred years since the Great War, and now you can see around Yeep the encroachment of modern times and the buildings coming very close to the sanctity. And they're taking away from the atmosphere of these cemeteries, not intentionally, but that's what they're doing in the end. And they're somehow encroaching on this sanctity that should be given to these men. Now we're driving south, out of Belgium and into France, near the city of Armentières. We're on our way to Le Trou 8 post, and I'm going there because it contains graves of some of the earliest Canadians killed in the Great War. Any soldier hit in the front line would be taken back to the 8th post for preliminary medical treatment. And if he was significantly wounded and not survived, he'd be buried adjacent to the dressing station. And that's what happened at Lutru. This is the register box, and it's a feature in every Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery. And in the box, they keep the visitor's book, which everybody should always sign, and most importantly, the register of the graves. This gives the details and locations of every grave in the cemetery. And we're gonna use this one right now. This is one of the most beautiful cemeteries on the old Western Front. And it's one of only two that I know of that have a moat. The cemeteries were created with flowers and shrubs and trees, places of tranquility for the families of the fallen to visit. This is the grave of Private George Stanley. In 1914, with the great patriotic fervor of the First World War, he enlisted with his 17-year-old son in the 15th Battalion, 48th Highlanders of Toronto. On the night of March 16, 1915, in the trenches near this position, he was shot by a German sniper. And the tragedy was his son was right beside him. A brief telegram from Ottawa late on Saturday night told Miss Agnes Quinton that the man she was engaged to be married to, Private E. Stanley, had been killed in action. Today, she is confined to her bed in a collapse. Another who will feel the shock of Private Stanley's death is Private Irwin Stanley, the 18-year-old son of the dead man, who went with his father in the same regiment to the front, and they were together all the time. Irwin Stanley survived the war and returned home to Canada, but his father has remained here, a reminder of the real story of the Great War. George Stanley was one of the very first Canadians to be killed in the Great War. His death would have been termed trench wastage, and he died on a day the war diaries would call quiet. All quiet on the Western Front. We're driving through the rolling countryside of the Somme, and in 1916, this was an infamous battlefield, and hundreds of thousands of men were killed here. There are dozens of war cemeteries all along the old front line, and we're interested in finding one that pertains to the Canadian actions in October 1916. We're looking for Regina Trench. The Battle of the Somme began on July 1st, 1916, when the British Army attacked the German positions. 
In a few hours, 20,000 soldiers were killed. After two and a half more months of fighting, 300,000 men had been lost, and the British Army was exhausted. They had used up the Australians, and the New Zealanders, and the South Africans, and now it was the Canadians' turn. This is Regina Trench Cemetery, and it's historically significant because it marks the battlefield of October the 8th, 1916. Regina Trench was a long German trench that ran along this valley over here. And up the slopes, they had their belts and belts of barbed wire. And October 8th, 1916, the Canadians tried to get through the uncut barbed wire. And of course, the attack was a catastrophe. The Canadians were shot down all along the front. So the cemetery has historical significance. And there's also very interesting graves here. This is the grave of Lance Corporal William Riddle. He was from La Touque, Quebec, and he was serving with the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles from Toronto. He was killed or missing October 1st, 1916, in the first assault on Regina Trench. He was 19 years old, and the inscription says, gone but not forgotten. You'll see that his headstone does not have the Latin cross. At the request of the family, when they returned the final verification form, they wanted the religious symbol omitted. War graves come with many different religions. They have Buddhist, they have Jewish, they have Hindu, and they have Muslim, and they have none at all. By the time the Battle of the Somme came to an end, a million men had perished, fighting for a few acres of farmers' fields. The futility and the sacrifice was so immense that many lost their faith. But the faith of others was strengthened, like Canon Frederick Scott, who had ministered to many wounded men during the battle. A man was brought in who looked very pale. A shell had burst at his feet, and his body was shattered. The man, thank God, did not suffer very acutely, as the shock had been so great. I knelt down beside him and talked to him. He was a French Canadian and a Roman Catholic. And as there happened to be no Roman Catholic chaplain present at the moment, I got him to repeat the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary and gave him the benediction. He died about a half an hour afterward. But even Canon Scott was not untouched by the tragedy of the song. His son Henry was killed in the fight for Regina Trench. After the battle, Canon Scott went searching for his son's body. I started at 6 a.m. for Regina Trench. I brought a little sketch with me that showed the shell hole where it was supposed his body had been buried. After a while, we came upon something white. It was my son's hand with a signet ring on it. I read the burial service and I took off the ring. We made a small mound where the body lay. The mist was lifting now and the sun to the east was beginning to light the ground. We're heading back to Belgium, near the village of Passchendaele. This is the Passchendaele battlefield. Today, it's really quite pretty farmland. But in October 1917, when the Canadians arrived here, the shelling had been so severe and the rain so heavy that all this area was churned into a lunar landscape of mud, shell holes, and dead bodies. It was the most infamous battlefield of the Canadians during the Great War. This is Passchendaele New British Cemetery, and it's significant because of its location. And it's also important because of the stories that the graves tell about the battle. The Battle of Passchendaele began on July 31st, 1917. And by November, the British had lost 250,000 men, but had failed to capture their objective, the village of Passchendaele. This is why it's historically significant. That's Passchendaele Church just over here and this is where the last phase of the battle took place. The Canadians were ordered to capture Passchendaele Village, and on November the 6th, 1917, they fought their way through the bloody morass and took the high ground at Passchendaele Church. The victory had cost the Canadians 16,000 casualties. Many of the war cemeteries have this stone of remembrance, 
and they all say their name liveth forevermore. Yet in this cemetery, the names of most of the men who fell here at Passchendaele have been lost in the mud. 80% of the graves in this cemetery are unidentified. There was thousands of unknowns. So an unknown second battalion, an unknown private, an unknown lieutenant, major, was nothing of significance. There was just no time to investigate them. So unless somebody was working on the staff of the Imperial War Graves Commission, who knew that unit intimately, the identification could not be made. Consequently, there are literally thousands of graves of unknowns that could be identified today. When the exhumation companies brought the men in here, some of them, like in this case, had partial information. In this situation, when I was records officer of the War Graves Commission, I came across a UCS, which is an unknown Canadian soldier, 2nd Battalion, and you can tell by the map location he was killed at Passchendaele. What was interesting about this case is there were some personal effects. In this case, a pen knife with initials on it. And the initials were quite unique. They were L-O-M. And checking the missing lists, only one man from the 2nd Battalion missing at Passchendaele had those initials, Leonard Oliver Millership. And he was killed in action at Passchendaele, November the 6th, 1917. And from that information, we could change the headstone from an unknown Canadian soldier to one of Millership. As records officer, I identified roughly 50 graves, primarily First World War, some Second World War, and it's all based on information that people either sent to you or were in the original records. The documents themselves are exceptional because they give you trench map references where all the bodies were recovered from and any personal effects that were on them. In a lot of cases, it's just a process of elimination. I love to put the story together. To do the story of one of these guys, to put the puzzle together and sort of close it after 80, 90, 100 years, gives you a real sense of satisfaction that finally Millership has found his rightful place. And this is almost a spiritual thing when you look into what happened to these guys and it's so sad that so many of them just went missing. They just vanished. So now you can actually finish the story. But there are graves from the Battle of Passchendaele where we do know their story. This is the grave of Private Alexander Dakota, 49th Battalion, Edmonton Regiment, Canadian Infantry, and he was killed in action near Passchendaele October 30th, 1917, and he was 28 years old. Dakota is quite an interesting character. He was a Cree from Saskatchewan originally. He was later a sergeant in the Edmonton Police, the first Aboriginal officer in Canadian history. He was a long distance runner who ran in the Olympics in 1912. And as the story goes, he was given a gold watch by George V after one of the races. And during the action at Passchendaele, he was sniped and killed. A German took the watch off him. Later on, the Canadians killed the German and got the watch back. He was one of about a thousand Canadian Aboriginals that served in the Great War. My dear sister, we don't know what we're gonna do this fall. One hears so many different rumors. Some claim that we are going from here as soon as our musketry training, as they call it, is over. I'm game for whatever comes. Anything to help finish this damn war. We all had to make our wills the other day, so that looks as if we must be going pretty soon, doesn't it? I made out my will to you. Of course, sis, if anything happens to me and I fail to come back, don't forget poor mother. I haven't much to divide, but I should like her to have a little. As ever, your loving brother, Alex. In every war cemetery, there's a sword mounted on a stone cross. It's known as the Cross of Sacrifice. Here, in the Battle of Passchendaele, so many men sacrificed not only their lives, but also their names. We're driving through the countryside east of Arras towards Cambrai, and we're going to go to Dominion Cemetery, which is a classic battlefield cemetery, and it represents the Battle of the Drocourt Quillant Line. As we leave the cities and villages behind, and head past the high-tech windmills and into lonely countryside. It's hard to believe we are passing over the scene 
of one of the greatest victories won by the Canadians in the Great War. Today, there is very little to remind us of the battle and of the men who fought it, except the war cemeteries. The cemetery was built between the front and support lines of the drocourt quiant line. And this is the southern side. And you can see the entire battlefield from here. You can see the crow's nest. You can see Cagny Corps. And this is where the Canadian Scottish advanced with the tanks. And they won two Victoria Crosses in the action. This is the grave of Sergeant Arthur George Knight, 10th Battalion, Alberta, Canadian Infantry. He was killed in action September the 3rd, 1918, and he was 32 years old. The day before, Knight had performed tremendous acts of courage on the battlefield. He had bayoneted a machine gun team. He had brought up Lewis guns to stop a German counterattack. He had also captured dozens of prisoners. For those actions, he was to be recommended for the Victoria Cross. For most conspicuous bravery, initiative, and devotion to duty, Sergeant Knight led a bombing section forward under very heavy fire and engaged the enemy at close quarters. And by his example of courage, gallantry, and initiative, was a wonderful inspiration to all. Unfortunately, he was killed the next day. Therefore, he never learned of his award. Because it was a posthumous VC, his headstone is unique and it bears the engraving of the Victoria Cross. A lot of the smaller cemeteries have some very nice architectural features. And here in Dominion, you have a stone bench. And from on top, we get a clear view of the northern battlefield. You can see in the distance, Montjury, and in front of us, the first division was attacking. And if you had time on September the 2nd, you would have watched the 4th Division being decimated by German machine gun fire crossing Mount Jury. But you can see the entire battlefield. The individual graves in each cemetery gives you great detail about who contributed to the battle and how they suffered. You can find men from the artillery, machine gun corps, and in this case, the Royal Air Force. And the Royal Air Force provided a lot of cover for the Battle of the Drocourt Quillant Line. They were strafing German trenches. They were strafing artillery batteries. This is the grave of Lieutenant Victor McElroy, Distinguished Flying Cross of Richmond, Ontario. And he was flying a Sopwith Camel over the DQ line when he was shot down and killed September the 2nd, 1918. Each grave has its own story. We're driving through the countryside west of Cambrai, and these were the Canadian battlefields at late September, October 1918. After we pass through Sancourt, a small French village completely unknown to Canadians, we drive along an old sunken road, and suddenly we come upon the site of one of Canada's greatest battlefields, one that confirmed the Canadians' reputation as the finest Allied fighting force on the Western Front, a victory that helped bring an end to the Great War. Every war cemetery tells a story, and Sancourt is no different. It reveals the terrible cost to Canada for these victories in the last 100 days of the war, 44,000 casualties. This is Sancourt British Cemetery, and it marks the battlefield of October 1st, 1918, just north of Cambrai. From here, you can see the open fields over which the Canadians attacked, and they were caught in the open. And for the 1st Division, it was only their second defeat of the war. 
The fighting in front of Cambrai had been so severe that they tried to move the men north to encompass the city, force the Germans to withdraw. And of course, the Germans weren't going to leave Cambrai, so this battlefield was particularly brutal. Here you have some very interesting personal inscriptions. Corporal R.A. Hartree, MM, Canadian Machine Gun Corps, killed in action 1 October 1918, age 20. Our laddie, till we meet again. Sergeant S.B. Barker, Military Medal, 1st Battalion, Western Ontario, killed in action September 30th, 1918, age 21. Dear Sid, you will never be forgotten by your loving mother. Private Manuel Bermudez, 14th Battalion, that's the Royal Montreal Regiment. He was killed in action October 1st, 1918, 24 years old. And the inscription reads, a son of Venezuela who fought and died for God's justice on earth. The ethnic diversity of the Canadian Corps was quite exceptional. There was men from Montenegro, Japan, Korea, India, uh, United States, Iceland, you name it. Everybody served with the Canadians in the First World War. So it's not correct to think of them only as one group. And the nationalities are just remarkable. One of the ethnic groups that had their own platoons were the Japanese Canadians. The Japanese platoon was assigned to a very dangerous spot, and we can often hear the enemy talking. We sang Japanese army songs to let them know we are around. Tomoki Kiyotsuku was firing at the enemy machine guns when he was hit in the face. He shouted, Yarareta! I'm hit! I received word that my son was killed in battle. We have funeral services. I have reverentially placed my son's Ihatsu lock of hair before Buddha's shrine. I hope my son is resting in peace. Although the majority of the graves in this cemetery are Canadian, it's called Sankor British Cemetery. During the war, a number of these cemeteries were known as Canadian, but in the post-war years, the Imperial War Graves Commission changed them to British. And this is a reflection of how the British viewed their dominions. driving southwest of Arras towards the village of Bellumont. It's in the Pas-de-Calais region of northern France. In 1918, Bellumont was typical of the small villages that dot this countryside. It was swarming with Allied troops. The Vandusian Battalion, the only French-Canadian battalion fighting on the Western Front, was stationed here. It's been a hundred years since they left, and there are still signs of their time here. This is Bellumont Communal Cemetery, and it's a civilian cemetery for the village. Most Canadians are buried in large war cemeteries amongst their comrades. But some Canadians are buried in isolated graves in small churchyards and local cemeteries like this one. There's one Canadian grave here. Here's his grave. The headstone reads, Reverend Georges Crochetier, Canadian Army Chaplain, attached 22nd Battalion, which was the French-Canadian Battalion, the Vandus, Canadian Infantry. Father Crochetier was well-liked by the villagers as he often gave sermons and celebrated mass in the local churches. On April 2nd, 1918, he had just tended to some wounded soldiers, and instead of going back, he insisted on staying with the men in the line. A few minutes later, an enemy shell hit his tent, killing him instantly. Out of a show of respect, they brought his body back here 
where he was buried in a Catholic cemetery. The inscription reads, Ammonier Catholique, Canadien Francais, Prier pour lui. Since this morning, I've been living in a hole which I dug myself. In the afternoon, Monsieur de Vienne offered to put up a shack which we will share. <laughs> you have to see it. It's a torn old tent found in a trench and covered in mud. Monsieur de Vienne has gone out on patrol. I've decided to stay put to enjoy the rain that is pouring down over me since everything leaks. Enemy bombardment was intense all day. There are 700 war cemeteries on the Western Front that contain at least one Canadian grave. We're heading towards the Channel Coast of France, south of Calais, to the village of Etap, a small port on the Canch River. This is where we reach our journey's end. And in the Great War, this was also the final destination for two million soldiers who had been wounded on the Western Front. They were cared for in more than 100 military hospitals, which were set up here close to the ports and shipping to make evacuation to England easier, far enough away from the front to keep them safe. This is a Tapples military cemetery near Lutuke on the Channel Coast, and it's an example of a hospital cemetery. This cemetery was started in 1915 and used until 1919. It contains 11,000 graves. Hospital cemeteries are very different from the others for a couple reasons. Firstly, almost all the men are identified. Secondly, they're all buried in chronological order based on the date they died during the war. And in some ways, the beauty of these cemeteries disguises the true suffering that a lot of these men went through before they died. They may have languished weeks from their wounds before finally passing. Some of these new patients have dreadful wounds. One young boy with part of his face shot away, both arms gone, and great wounds in both legs. Surely death were merciful. These are the horrors of war, but they are too horrible. Our boy is only 20 years old. The range and severity of wounds in the Great War are appalling. A soldier in the front line could be sniped, he could be gassed, he could be hit by a piece of shell or trench mortar. And once he was wounded, he was dependent on the medical staff to get him out. He would be taken from the front by field ambulance to the casualty clearing stations. And that's where the triage took place. And if he was gonna survive, he would get on a hospital train and be brought to the Channel Coast. And here he would get great medical treatment from the doctors and the nursing sisters. There were what we called dirty cases, where infection had set in, owing to the men laying for hours in muddy trenches before being picked up by stretcher bearers. By the time they reached the hospitals, following an amputation at the casualty clearing station, gas gangrene had developed. Now gas gangrene carries the most horrible smell anyone could imagine. It was in the air. It saturated our hair and clothes. Once having smelled gas gangrene, one could never forget it. During the Great War, German aircraft bombed Allied hospitals on several occasions. On May 19, 1918, in the evening, 15 German bombers came over ETAP and dropped more than 100 bombs, and most of them landed right on the number one Canadian general hospital, and in particular, the nurses' barracks. Sixty-six Canadian medical personnel 
were killed outright or died of wounds. At a terrible air raid from 10.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m., Miss McDonald was killed. She had a small wound, but it must have severed the femoral artery as she died of hemorrhage almost immediately. Nursing sister, Catherine McDonald, Canadian Army Nursing Service. She was killed in action May 19, 1918, and her inscription reads, killed in action, beloved daughter of Angus and Mary Maud McDonald, Brantford, Canada. Miss Lowe died this AM. She had a fractured skull, was unconscious towards the last. This is nursing sister Margaret Lowe, Canadian Army Nursing Service. She died of wounds nine days later, May 28, 1918. Her personal inscription reads, she did her duty for king and country. Poor little Gladys Wake has the most dreadful wounds. Gangrene, I'm sure from the odor. Gladys died at three o'clock. This is the grave of nursing sister Gladys Wake, Canadian Army Nursing Service. She died of wounds two days later, May 21st, 1918. And the personal inscription reads, the noble army of martyrs, praise thee. The killing of the sisters and the bombing of the hospital created a public outrage. And when the sisters were brought here for burial, they were brought here with full military honors. And uniquely, the event was even filmed. Gladys buried at 9.30. We all went to the funeral. It was dreadfully trying. A million families lost loved ones during the Great War and it brought about a level of suffering that was unheard of. These war cemeteries offered a vent to some of that suffering. Today, the war cemeteries are our link through the graves and through the personal inscriptions to their grief. We know the real war is in the cemeteries. An ever-loving memory of our only dear child our loss, his glory. Oft times our thoughts do wander to the graves so far away. He saved others, himself he could not save. I held my tongue and spoke nothing, but it was grief and pain to me. A light from our household has gone, one we can never replace. Joe enjoyed life, but sacrificed it in defense of home and country. He gave his life for his friends. Not gone from memory or from love, but to the eternal home above. Time changes many things, but loving memory ever clings. He nobly died for the empire. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for a friend. In loving memory of our dear son, sadly missed at home. Here honor comes, a pilgrim gray, to bless the turf that wrap his clay. Beneath sleeps one we love, but one we could not save. Gone from us, but not forgotten, loving wife and little son. <laughs>